Welcome to Worship with Messiah Online. We're glad you're with us today. Just a couple announcements. Um, Caring Hands Food Pantry is still in need of food. They're just barely keeping up this summer. Our regular monthly drop-off day is tomorrow, Monday, July 1, from 9 to 11 a.m. Of course, you can always drop off food on Sundays or, quite honestly, almost any time that the office is open. So, thanks for all you do for Caring Hands, and we ask you to keep it up. Also, this summer, we have several Bible study groups going on. Uh, our Women's Study Living Vine meets Thursdays at 9.30. Our Seniors Bible Study meets Monday at 3.30. And we have a men's group that meets at 7.30 a.m. on Thursday and a, men, a men's group that meets on Saturdays at 7.30. You are welcome and invited to participate in any of those groups. Now with that, let's begin worship in the name of, of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Come, let us worship our King. Come, let us bow at His feet. He has done great things. See what our Savior has done. His love overcomes, He has done great things, He has done great things. Oh, hero of heaven, you conquered the grave, you free every captive and break every chain, oh God, you have done great things. We dance in your freedom, awake and alive. Oh, Jesus, our Savior, your name lifted high. Oh, God, you have done great things. You've been faithful through every storm. You'll be faithful forever. Let's pray. God of wisdom, 
you have encouraged us to live our lives grounded in faith, patience, and your love. Help us to love others without judgment, but with a loving acceptance. Help us to seek you, but also to wait for you to reveal your presence to us and to learn to encounter you in our relationship with the people you love. We pray in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. rocks cry out to worship whose glory taught the stars to shine perhaps creation longs to have the words to sing but this joy is mine with the thought Our scripture passage today is from Luke chapter 2, beginning at the 22nd verse. When the time came for the purification rites required by the law of Moses, Joseph and Mary took him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As it is written in the law of the Lord, every firstborn male is to be consecrated to the Lord. And to offer a sacrifice in keeping with what is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of doves or two young pigeons. Now there was a man in Jerusalem called Simeon who was righteous and devout. 
He was waiting for the consolation of Israel and the Holy Spirit was on him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not die before he had seen the Lord's Messiah. Moved by the Spirit, he went into the temple courts. When the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him what the custom of the law required, Simeon took him in his arms and praised God, saying, Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, you may now dismiss your servant in peace. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the sight of all nations, a light for revelation to the Gentiles, and the glory of your people Israel. The children's father and mother marveled at what was said about him. Then Simeon, then Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother, This child is destined to cause the falling and rising of many in Israel, and to be a sign that will be spoken against, so that the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed, and a sword will pierce your own soul too. There was also a prophet, Anna, the daughter of Penuel, of the tribe of Asher. She was very old. She had lived with her husband seven years after her marriage and then was a widow until she was 84. She never left the temple but worshipped night and day, fasting and praying. Coming up to them at that very moment, she gave thanks to God and spoke about the child to all who were looking forward to the redemption of Jerusalem. This is the good news of the Lord. Siblings in Christ, grace and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord and our Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Can we find God? In Matthew chapter 7, verses 7 and 8, Jesus tells his disciples, Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, the one who seeks finds, and to the one who knocks, the door will be opened. That sounds pretty simple, doesn't it? Dietrich Bonhoeffer was the German Lutheran theologian who ran a series of underground seminaries after the Nazi party took over Germany and along with it the Lutheran churches in Germany. Bonhoeffer Later, later participated in a failed plot to have Hitler assassinated, and then he was executed by the German army only weeks before the end of World War II. In his famous book, The Cost of Discipleship, while discussing this passage in Matthew chapter 7 about asking, seeking, and knocking, Bonhoeffer says that disciples of Jesus are to request, seek, and knock and God will hear and answer their prayers. But he goes on to distinguish, to distinguish the seeking of Jesus' followers from those who don't know and follow Jesus yet. Only those who already know God, Bonhoeffer says, can seek God. How could they seek what they do not know? How can they find if they don't know what they're looking for? Which brings me back to my initial question. Can we find God? And if so, how? Now, you might be thinking, Pastor Jay, this is a funny question to ask today, as we are now in the fifth and final week of the series we've been calling Searching for God. Especially if Bonhoeffer is right that we can't even search for God unless we already know God. Let's review where we've been in this series. First week, Pastor Bob assured us that God is good. Three weeks ago, we looked at why God allows bad things to happen. One of the reasons that bad things happen, that there is evil in the world, is that God didn't make us to be puppets. And we are, on some level, selfish and self-centered. We rebel against God, try to be in charge ourselves. But God is at work resisting evil, including, most obviously, through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. In week three, we looked at God's love. God is the source of perfect, unconditional love. And when we experience God's love, we're able to share that love with others. 
Then last week, we asked the question, how can we know God's will? And we looked at examples of spiritual practices that will help us listen to and recognize Jesus' voice. And today, we finish up by asking, can we find God? I sometimes joke, at least half joke, about having grown up in what might be referred to as the Baptist wing of the Lutheran Church. Being asked a question like, have you found Jesus, was pretty common. My favorite answer to that question, although I can't take credit for coming up with it, is, have I found Jesus? I didn't even know he was missing. Over the last several months, I've told you several stories by Dr. Andrew Root, who teaches at Luther Seminary, in one of his recent books. Some of the stories have something to do with a young man nicknamed Waz. Waz shows up unexpectedly at a Bible study at the small, shrinking Presbyterian church that his grandmother belonged to before her death. And he tells the people at the Bible study that he's there because on her deathbed, his grandmother told him to find God. And he didn't know where else to look. Which absolutely terrifies the Bible study participants. Can they find God? Even if they have an answer to this question, how could they explain to somebody else how to find God? What does it even mean to them to find God? Dr. Root suggests that the passage we read today from Luke chapter 2 gives us an approach to answering the question of whether and how we can find God. This passage is often preached on sometime around or maybe just after Christmas. And we could use this passage as a study on what it means to be ritually pure by Old Testament standards according to Leviticus 12. Or about how firstborn sons were supposed to be redeemed according to Exodus chapter 13. Or even as one of the few New Testament passages we have that tell us something about Jesus' childhood. But following Dr. Root... I want to focus on Anna and Simeon. Simeon is described as a righteous and devout man who was waiting for God to send a Messiah who would bring comfort to God's people. He appears to be a regular in the temple. Hannah is described as an elderly widowed prophet who never leaves the temple. I wonder whether she actually went home to sleep. But she spends time in the temple worshiping, fasting, and praying day and night. Simeon is in the temple courts. and Mary and Joseph show up at the temple to dedicate the baby Jesus. And they hand Jesus to Simeon, who praises God. Then Anna the prophet shows up, comes up to them. Also thanks God and prophesies about this child to everyone who will listen. The story is a beautiful reminder that when we hear the good news told, God is going to show up. In the story, the presence of Jesus is seen as a long-awaited answer to a request. God sees, hears, and responds, just not always on our timetable. They've been asking, and now that Simeon has seen Jesus, he says, now I'm okay. I've seen God's promise fulfilled, and Anna the prophet confirms that fulfillment. Jesus comes to a world where people are eagerly waiting for God, even if they don't know that Jesus is who they're waiting and looking for. Anna and Simeon embody this desire and this sense of waiting. As Andy Root points out, Simeon and Anna are devout Jews who are waiting for God to act to save the people of Israel. And Mary and Joseph show up and literally just give them Jesus. I'm convinced that God is always present and always at work in the world. But especially in our secular materialistic culture, we seldom recognize how God is present or what God is doing. If God is at work in the world all the time, you might think that we would notice it all the time, but we don't. 
Maybe that's why Anglican theologian John McQuarrie defined a miracle not on what exactly it is that God is doing, but instead he defined a miracle as when we notice that God is doing something in the world. And as Andy Root points out, we often find God, or perhaps better put, experience God's presence or God at work in the world in our relationships with other people. Mary and Joseph literally handed Simeon the baby Jesus. God in Jesus is always present, but often we find God or God finds us in our relationships. Now back to our friend Waz, the young man who showed up at a Bible study trying to find God. Sue, one of the church's leaders, was terrified. She worried that he would want a list of three easy steps. And when they couldn't give him the list, he would leave. But he didn't. He just kept showing up. He didn't say much during discussions, but he laughed quite a bit. His laughter became contagious. After a while, he brought coffee and donuts from the coffee shop where he worked. And that day, Herbert, a man in his 80s, told the group to thank God for Waz. Then he looked at Waz and said, How nice that you brought coffee and donuts tonight. It's great having you here, bud. And Waz said more said more than he had said at any Bible study so far when he responded, thanks Herbert, that means a lot, but I'd also like to thank God for you all. Being with you all reminds me so much of my grandma. And it hurts a little bit. Waz went on to explain how he had come to live with his grandmother and how she, how she had been his closest friend. The group prayed and Sue relaxed for the first time since Waz had shown up looking for God. The next week, the Bible study's topic was the story of Simeon and Hannah from Luke chapter 2. As they studied and discussed the passage, Sue had a realization. After admitting that she had had no idea how to find God, she said, but now I think I do. Simeon's story helps me see how we can help you find God. What I just realized is, we can't find God, but if we wait together, I think God will find us. Simeon doesn't find Jesus, but Jesus and his parents find Simeon. I think how we can help you, Waz, is by waiting with you for God to reach out to you. After telling this part of the story, Andy Root goes on to discuss how we find God or how God finds us in a process that includes waiting, resonance, and relationships. We don't like waiting, especially in our late modern materialistic culture where so many things are immediately available. Waiting can feel like torture. Why haven't they replied to my email or my text? How come Amazon didn't deliver my package today? We think everything's automatic and immediate. And waiting, real waiting, as opposed to waiting around for no good reason, is waiting for something, like maybe like that package to be delivered. Now, maybe you're waiting for the bus, for your tank to get filled up with gas, for the next episode of The Bachelorette, for the new iPhone to come out, or for this message to be over soon. But waiting, real waiting, is waiting for something, and waiting is no fun. Maybe that's why we put so much emphasis on getting or being busy. Being busy can be a badge of pride or a sign that you're alive. As Regina Spector's song, You've Got Time, the theme song for Orange is the New Black, pointed out, taking steps is easy, standing still is hard. Waiting seems unnatural in our culture. But as Andy Root points out, 
we can never completely escape waiting. And waiting for the right things can be good for us. Sometimes waiting is necessary. We wait for a baby to be born, and the birth of that baby will change our experience of living in this world. And we wait, like Simeon and Anna, for the revelation of Jesus Christ. Like Simeon, we encounter Jesus by waiting. Sometimes we need to be still, stop all of our activity, stop running around, and wait. As we read in Psalm 40, verse 16, be still and know that I am God. We acknowledge that God is God when we realize that we need to wait for God to act. German sociologist Hartmut Rosa sees the need to be busy as one of the chief problems of today's culture. We feel the pace of our lives increasing, and today's capital runs on both a need for speed and a need for constant growth, which has even infected church culture. This creates unhealthy behaviors and relationships even in the church. The solution, suggests both Rosa and Root, is what they call resonance. Yes, we have to wait, including waiting for God, but waiting for God can be and is actually full of action. We wait for God in part by being active and in relationship with the world and people around us. As Sue's comments about waiting with Waz suggested, waiting for God includes, includes waiting expectantly for God to show up and act, for God to find us, and it includes taking steps to be ready when God arrives, when God acts in our lives. And we need to wait because God is God, meaning that God is in charge of the timetable, and we're not. Waiting for God expecting the God who is God to show up and taking steps to be ready when God does involves, among other things, spending time in prayer while we wait. This kind of waiting isn't just doing nothing as if we were Han Solo, frozen in carbonite. No, this waiting is a form of seeking God's face. And in this sense, it's a form of action. But unlike much action in our world, it's not about acquiring something because we can't acquire the God who is God. It is waiting for the sake of being in relationship, participating in a relationship with God. And we never really have or own a relationship. We simply get to be in a relationship that we share with God somebody. And this sense of being in a relationship is what sociologist Rosa, perhaps following the romantic poets or philosophers, calls resonance. By resonance, he means having the sense of being in relationship connected to someone or something other than yourself and feeling that connection. This resonance, this sense of relationship and connection may often include emotion. Maybe the kind of emotion you might feel when you're singing one of your favorite hymns or your favorite worship songs or having some experience that reminds you of your relationship with God or with your family or your friends. But this resonance is more than emotion. It inspires us to act to relate to others, to be different in some way or another in the world. It inspires us to act because it includes this connection, this affection, this love. And love at some point is or leads us to action. After all, God loved the world, so God sent God's only Son. This love, this affection produces an action. So resonance, according to Rosa, is a relationship, a sense of connection to something or someone outside yourself, which includes affection and connection, and it motivates you to some kind of action. 
And it is in these relationships that we encounter each other and in which we find God or perhaps more accurately have God given to us and experience God's presence. Last week we talked about spiritual practices which help us to recognize Jesus' voice and then help us know Jesus. For example, we attend public worship, we spend time in prayer, maybe in connection with devotional reading or, or meditation. We study the Bible. We can do that alone or in a group. We serve, and again, we can do that in a group. We give, and we tell others about Jesus. We share our faith in relationships. And Ruth suggests that the, the most important of these practices, for at least for the purposes of waiting for and then encountering God's presence, are the ones that bring us into relationship with other people. Attending worship, attending a Bible study, telling others about or us hearing about Jesus, and then serving or being served by others. Here he picks up on an idea from Matthew chapter 25 where Jesus says that we encounter him in relationship with the people we serve. Remember Herbert and Waz? Waz began to experience Jesus' presence by building a relationship with 80-something-year-old Herbert. And Herbert experienced Jesus too. You see, Waz started driving Herbert to his doctor appointments. And they got to know each other. One night at, at Bible study, Waz asked, Hey, have any of you guys seen Herbert's workshop? Not everyone in the group knew that Herbert was a woodworker. And that several pieces, including the beautiful crosses on the end of each pew, had been made by Herbert and decorated, decorated the church. Yeah, Waz went on. He's super good. I saw a bunch of cool stuff he's working on. No one else in the group, even the ones who knew he was a woodworker, realized that Herbert was still working on projects. Waz kept going. The coolest stuff is the guitars and the banjos. I liked that part. <laughs> the Bible study group was getting a new look at Herbert through the lens of his relationship with Waz. Do you play? asked Sue. A little embarrassed that she didn't know the answer, despite how long she had known Herbert. Does he play? Was interrupted. He played with Johnny Cash. Herbert stopped Was from gushing here, and he explained that Johnny Cash had visited the factory where he worked and bought one of their guitars. Playing with Johnny Cash was a one time thing at the factory. But still, how cool was that? Waz shared how his father had been a Johnny Cash fan, and he had a blast getting to know Herbert and hearing him play, and getting to play along with some old Johnny Cash songs. And Herbert shared how much he enjoyed playing those songs with Waz and a couple friends that Waz brought over one day. He had so much fun that he cried tears of joy after they left. The Bible study group waited. And God showed up. God showed up for Herbert and Waz. And God showed up for Waz and Herbert. We encounter God when others give us Jesus, the Messiah who died and rose for us because of God's love. We find God is handed to us in waiting, resonance, and relationship. And experiencing God's presence changes our lives. Amen. And now I invite you to join me as we confess our faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. 
On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. In Deuteronomy chapter 14, verses 22 and 23, we read, You shall tithe all the yield of your seed that comes from the field year by year, and before the, the Lord your God, in the place that he will choose to make his name dwell there. You shall eat the tithe of your grain, of your wine and of your oil, and the firstborn of your herd and flock that you may learn to fear the Lord your God always. We're called to give generously because everything is really God's and we are caretakers of what God has provided for us. And giving financially helps us learn to give of ourselves, giving our lives to Jesus for the sake of serving God's kingdom. Many people are cared for, nurtured, and met and fed physically and spiritually, both at and through Messiah and the other ministries we support through your tithes and your offerings. There are, of course, various ways to give, including mailing a check, giving online, or texting Messiah YL to the number on the screen. Thank you for all your support and all that you do to help us love God and love one another. Please join me in prayer. Lord, our God, maker of all things, through your goodness you have blessed us with abundance beyond measure. With our offerings, we give ourselves to you for your service and dedicate our lives to the care and redemption of all the people you have made. Help us to seek you and to share you with others. You are God of heaven and earth the creator of this world that you love and that you made to be good. Forgive us for our self-centeredness and our failure. By the death and resurrection of your son, Jesus Christ, give us new life in you. Give us victory over everything that would separate us from you and from our neighbors. Be with us in our relationships as we both give and receive your love. We pray in the name of Jesus, who gave his life and rose so that we may be reconciled to you and to all people. Amen. Now, gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, let's join in the prayer our Lord taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And now let's sing our sending song.
Receive the benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord's face shine upon you with grace and with mercy. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in peace. Serve the Lord with joy. Thanks be to God. <laughs>